Q. Adams and Baker are American citizens residing in the Philippines. Adams befriended Baker and became a frequent visitor at his house. One day, Adams arrived with 30 members of the Philippine National Police, armed with a search warrant authorizing the search of Baker's house and its premises for dangerous drugs being trafficked to the United States of America. The search purportedly yielded positive results, and Baker was charged with violation of the Dangerous Drugs Act. Adams was the prosecution's principal witness. However, for failure to prove his guilt beyond reasonable doubt, Baker was acquitted. Baker then sued Adams for the damages for filing trumped up charges against him. Among the defenses raised by Adams in, is that he has diplomatic immunity, conformably with the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. He presented diplomatic notes from the American Embassy stating that he is an agent of the United States Drug Enforcement Agency tasked with conducting surveillance operations on suspected drug dealers in the Philippines believed to be the source of prohibited drugs being shipped to the U.S. It was also stated that after having ascertained the target, Adams would then inform the Philippine narcotic agents to make the actual arrest. A. As counsel of plaintiff Baker, argue why his complaint should not be dismissed on the ground of defendant Adams' diplomatic immunity from suit. B. As counsel of defendant Adams, argue the dismissal of the complaint. A. As counsel for Baker, I would argue that Adams is not a diplomatic agent considering that he is not a head of mission nor he is part of the diplomatic staff that is accorded diplomatic rank. Thus, the suit should not be dismissed as Adams has no diplomatic immunity under the 1961 Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. B. As counsel for Adams, I would argue that he worked for the United States Drug Enforcement Agency and was tasked to conduct surveillance of suspected drug activities within the country with the approval of the Philippine government. Under the doctrine of state immunity from suit, if the acts giving rise to a suit are those of a foreign government done by its foreign agent, although not necessarily a diplomatic personage, but acting in his official capacity, the complaint could be barred by the immunity of the foreign sovereign from suit without its consent. Adams may not be a diplomatic agent, but the Philippine government has given its imprimatur, if not consent, to the activities within Philippine territory of Adams, and thus he is entitled to the defense of state immunity from suit. Miniature versus CA. Q. Ambassador Gaylor, a state juvenus diplomatic representative to state hinterlands, during one of her his vacation, Ambassador Gaylor decided to experience for himself the sights and sounds of State Paradise, a country known for its beauty and other attractions. While in State Paradise, Ambassador Gaylor was caught in the company of children under suspicious circumstances. He was arrested for a violation of the strict anti pedophilia statute of state paradise. He claims that he is immune from arrest and incarceration by virtue of his diplomatic immunity. Does the claim of Ambassador Gaylor hold water? Answer. Ambassador Gaylor cannot invoke his diplomatic immunity in accordance with paragraph 1, article 31 of the Vienna Convention of Diplomatic Relations, since state paradise is not his receiving area state. He does not enjoy diplomatic immunity within his territory. Under paragraph 1, article 40 of the Vienna Convention of Diplomatic Relations, he cannot be accorded diplomatic immunity in state paradise because he is not passing through it to take up or return to his port or to return to state paradise. Q. An executive agreement was executed between the Philippines and a neighboring state. The Senate of the Philippines took it upon itself to procure a certified true copy of the executive agreement and after deliberating on it, declared by an unanimous vote that the agreement was both unwise and against the best interests of the country. Is the executive agreement binding a. from the standpoint of Philippine law and b. from the standpoint of international law? Answer a. From the standpoint of Philippine law, the executive agreement is binding according to Commission of Customs versus Eastern Sea Trading. The President can enter into an executive agreement without the necessity of concurrence by the state. 
B. The executive agreement is also binding from the standpoint of international law, as held in Bayan, Bayan versus Samora. In international law, executive agreements are equally binding as treaties upon the states who are parties to them. Additionally, under Article 2, Number 1, Letter A of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, whatever may be the designation of a written agreement between states, whether it is indicated as a treaty convention or executive agreement, is not legally significant. Still, it is considered treaty and governed by the international law of treaties. Q. May a treaty violate international law? If your answer is in the affirmative, explain when such may happen. If your answer is in the negative, explain why. Answer. Yes. A treaty may violate international law if it conflicts with a preemptory norm or just cogence of international law. Just cogence norm is defined as the norm of general international law accepted and recognized by the international community of states as a whole as a norm from which no derogation is permitted and which can be modified only by a subsequent norm of general international law having the same character. Article 53 of the Vienna Convention of the Law of Treaties provides that a treaty is void if at the time of its conclusion it conflicts with Jus Cogens norm. Moreover, under Article 54 of this convention, if a new preemptory norm of general international law emerges, an existing treaty which is in conflict with the norm becomes void and terminates. Q. The President alone, without the concurrence of the Senate, abrogated a treaty, assumed that the other country party to the treaty is agreeable to the abrogation provided it complies with the Philippine Constitution. If a case involving the valid validity of a treaty abrogation is brought to the Supreme Court, how should it be resolved? Answer. The Supreme Court should dismiss the case. The jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, or of all lower courts, over a treaty is only with respect to questions of its constitutionality or validity. See Article 8, Section 5, Number 2, Letter A of 1987 Constitution. In other words, the question should involve the constitutionality of a treaty or its validity in relation to a statute, Gonzalez v. Hen Genova. It does not pertain to the termination or abrogation of a treaty. The authority of the Senate over treaties is limited to concurrence, Article 8, Section 21 of the 1987 Constitution, there being no express constitutional provision regulating the termination or abrogation of treaties, it is presumed that the power of the President over treaty agreements and over foreign relations includes the authority to abrogate, or more properly referred as terminate, treaties. The termination of the treaty by the President without the concurrence of the Senate is not subject to constitutional attack, there being no Senate authority to that effect. The Philippines is a party to the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, hence the said convention thus becoming part of the of Philippine law governs the act of the President in terminating or abrogating the treaty. Article 54 of this convention provides that a treaty may be terminated at any time by consent of all the parties. Apparently, the treaty in question is a bilateral treaty in which the other state is agreeable to its termination. Article 67 of the Convention adds the formal requirement that the termination must be in an instrument communicated to the other party signed by the head of state or of government or by the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Alternative answer. The Supreme Court should dismiss the case, the case involved is a political question because it involves the authority of the President in the conduct of foreign relations and the extent to which the Senate is authorized to negate the action of the President. Since Section 21, Article 7 of the Constitution is silent as to the participation of the Senate in the abrogation of a treaty, the question may be answered in different ways and should be decided by political standards rather than judicially manageable standards. Coldwater versus Carter. Alternative answer. While it is the president who negotiates and ratifies treaties and other international agreements, it must be underscored that when the same has been concurred by the qualified majority of the state, they become part of the law of the land. Accordingly, it is admitted that the president alone cannot unilaterally abrogate a treaty without congressional authorization in the same way that she should have no authority to repeal a law. Further, 
even as what the Constitution requires it in the concurrence of the state in treaties and international agreements entered into, not the abrogation of the same, the same should not also be construed as empowering the president to simply render nugatory a treaty that has already acquired the imprimatur of the Senate. Coldwater v. Carter President Black Q. of the Republic of Pacentia, RP, had a telephone conversation with President Blue of the People's Republic of Conquerors, PRC. In that conversation, both leaders agreed that they will both and other they will both pull out all their vessels, civilian or otherwise, sea craft in other ships from the hotly disputed Calmado Shoal area within eight days in order to de-escalate the situation. After eight days, all RP ships and vessels have left the area. However, several military and civilian ships carrying the PRC flag remain in the area and begin construction of a dock that could provide fuel and other supplies to the vessel passing by. Letter A. Assuming that President Black and President Blue both had full capacity to represent their states and negotiate with each other under their respective system of government, and further assuming that both leaders acknowledge the existence of the conversation, is a verbal agreement by a telephone binding under international law, explain. B. Assuming that answer to A is in affirmative, the start agreement constitutes a treaty under the 1969 Vienna Convention on Law and Treaties, 2012 Bar. Answer to letter A. The verbal agreement by telephone is binding between the parties on the basis of customary international law. B. The verbal agreement does not constitute a treaty under Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Article 3 requires that for an international agreement to be treaty, to be a treaty, it must be in written form. Q. In a raid conducted by rebels in Cambodian town, an American businessman who has been a long-time resident of the place was caught by the rebels and robbed of his cash and other valuable personal belongings. Within minutes, two truckload of government troops arrived, prompting the rebels to withdraw. Before fleeing, they shot the American, causing him physical injuries. Government troopers immediately launched pursuit operation and killed several rebels. No cash or other valuable property taken from the American businessman was recovered. In an action for indemnity filed by the U.S. government in behalf of the businessman for injuries and losses in cash and property, the Cambodian government contended that under international law, it was not responsible for the act of the rebels. A. Is the contention of the Cambodian government correct? B. Suppose the rebellion is successful and a new government gains control of the entire state, replacing the lawful government that was toppled, may the new government be held responsible for the injuries or losses suffered by the American businessman? Explain. Answer to letter A. Yes, the contention of the Cambodian government is correct unless it clearly appears that the government has failed to use promptly and with appropriate force its constitution constituted authority, it cannot be held responsible for the acts of rebels, for the rebels are not its agents and their acts were done without its volition. In this case, government troopers immediately pursued the rebels and killed several of them. Letter B. The new government may be held responsible if it succeeds in overthrowing the government. Victorious rebel movements are responsible for all the illegal acts of their focus forces during the course of the rebellion. The acts of the rebels are imputable to them when they assumed a duly constituted authorities of the state. Q. A. A British photojournalist was covering the violent protest of the Thai Red Shirts movement in Bangkok. Despite warnings given by the Thai Prime Minister to foreigners, especially journalists, A. moved around the Thai capital. In the course of his coverage, he was killed with a stray bullet which was later identified as having come from the rank of the Red Shirts. The wife of A sought relief from Thai authorities but was refused assistance. A. Is there state responsibility on the part of Thailand? Answer. There is no state responsibility on the part of Thailand. The wrongful act in question is an act of private individuals and not of an organ of the government or a state official. Hence, it is not attributable to Thailand at its wrongful act for the purpose of state responsibility. B. What is the appropriate remedy available to the victim's family under international law? 
A, the appropriate remedy available to the family of A is to seek diplomatic protection from Great Britain to press a claim for reparation. However, in order that the claim will be allowable under customary international law, the family of A must first exhaust the legal remedies available in Thailand. Q. Police officer Henry Magiting of the Narcotics Section of the Western Police District applied for a search warrant in the Regional Trial Court of Manila for violation of Section 11, Article 2 of the Republic Act 96965, a uh, Comprehensive Dangerous Drugs Act of 2002 for the search and seizure of heroin in the cabin of the captain of the MSS Sea Star, a foreign registered vessel which was moored at the South Harbor, Manila, its port of destination. Based on the affidavits of the applicant's witnesses who were crew members of the vessel, they saw a box containing 10 kilograms of heroin under the bed in the captain's ca cabin. The RTC found probable costs for the issuance of a search warrant. Nevertheless, it denied the application on the ground that Philippine courts have no criminal jurisdiction over violations of RA number 9165 committed on foreign registered vessels found in Philippine waters. Is the ruling of the court correct? Support your answers with reason. A. The RDC may assert its jurisdiction over the case by invoking the territorial principle which provides that crimes committed within the state's territorial boundaries and persons within that territory, either permanently or temporarily, are subject to the application of local law. Jurisdiction may also be asserted on the basis of the universality principle, which confers upon all states the right to exercise jurisdiction over delicta juris gentium, or international crimes such as the international traffic narcotics. The possession of 10 kilos of heroin constitute commercial quantity and therefore qualifies as trafficking of narcotics. Consequently, the denial of the search warrant should have been anchored on the failure of the court to conduct personal examination of the witnesses to the crime in order to establish probable cause, as required by Section 3 and 4 of Rule 126. In any event, there is no showing that the requisite quantum of probable cause was established by mere reference to the affidavits and other documentary evidence presented. Q. William, a private American citizen, a university graduate, and frequent visitor to the Philippines, was inside the U.S. Embassy when he got into a heated argument with a private Filipino citizen. Then in front of many shocked witnesses, he killed the person he was arguing with. The police came and brought him to the nearest police station. Upon reaching the station, the police investigator in halting English informed William of his Miranda rights and assigned him an independent local counsel. William refused the services of the lawyer and insisted that he be assisted by a Filipino lawyer currently based in the U.S. The request was denied and the counsel assigned by the police state for the duration of the investigation. William protested his arrest. He argued that since the incident took place inside the U.S. Embassy, Philippine courts have no jurisdiction because the U.S. Embassy grounds are not part of Philippine territory. Thus, technically, no crime under Philippine law was committed. Is William correct? Explain your answer. A. William is not correct. The premises occupied by the United States Embassy do not constitute territory of the United States, but of the Philippines. Crimes committed within them are subject to the territorial jurisdiction of the Philippines. Since William has no diplomatic immunity, the Philippines can prosecute him if it acquires custody over him. Q. If William applies for bail, claiming that he is entitled thereto under the international standard of justice and that he comes from the U.S. state that has outlawed capital punishment, should William be granted bail as a matter of right? A. William should not be granted bail as a matter of right. He is subject to flipping criminal jurisdiction, therefore his right to bail must be determined on the basis of Section 13, Article 3 of the Constitution. Q. Under its statute, give two limitations on the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. A. The following are the limitations on the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice under its statute. Letter A. Only states may be parties in cases before it. Article 34. B. The consent of the parties is needed for the court to acquire jurisdiction over a case. Article 36. Q. Compare and contrast the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court and International Court of Justice. Answer. Letter A. The jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice pertains to international responsibility in the concept of civil liability, while that of the International Criminal Court pertains to criminal liability. B. 
while states are the subject of law and international responsibility under the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice, the criminal liability within the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court pertains to individual natural person. Article 34. Q. Who are stateless persons under international law? What are the consequences of statelessness? Is a stateless person entirely without right, protection, or recourse under the law of nations? What measure, if any, has international law taken to prevent statelessness? Answer. Letter A. Stateless persons are those who are not considered as nationals by any state under the operation of its laws. B. The consequences of statelessness are the following. Letter A. No state can intervene or complain in behalf of a state less person for an international delinquency committed by another state in inflicting injury upon him. b. He cannot be expelled by the state if he is lawfully in its territory except on grounds of national security or public order. c. He cannot avail himself of the protection and benefits of citizenship like securing for himself a passport or visa and personal documents. Letter C. No, under the Convention in relation to the status of stateless person, the contracting states agreed to accord to stateless person within their territories treatment at least as favorable as that accorded to their nationals with respect to freedom of religion, access to the court, rationing of products in short supply, elementary education, public relief and assistance, labor legislation, and social security. They also agreed to accord to them treatment not less than favorable than the accorded to aliens generally in the same circumstances. The convention also provides for the issuance of identity papers and travel documents to stateless persons. D. In the Convention of the Conflict of Nationality Laws of 1930, the contracting states agreed to accord nationality to persons born in their territory who would otherwise be stateless. The Convention on the Reduction of Statelessness of 1961 provides that if the law of the contracting states result in the loss of nationality of a consequent of marriage or termination of marriage, such loss must be conditional upon possession or acquisition of another nationality. Alternative answer. Under the Convention on the Reduction of Statelessness of 1961, a contracting state still grant its nationality to a person born in its territory who would otherwise be stateless and a contracting state may not deprive a person or a group of persons of their nationality for racial, ethnic, religious, or political grounds. Extradition Q. The extradition treaty between France and the Philippines is silent as to its applicability with respect to crimes committed prior to its effectivity. Can France demand the extradition of A, a French national residing in the Philippines, for an offense committed in France prior to the effectivity of the treaty? Explain. Can A, contest his extradition on the ground that it violates the ex post facto provision of the Philippine Constitution? Answer to letter A. Yes, France can ask for the extradition of A for an offense committed in France before the effectivity of the extradition treaty between France and the Philippines. In Cleu versus Stracos, it was held that an extradition treaty applies to crimes committed before its effectivity unless the extradition treaty expressly exempts them. As Whiteman points out, extradition does not define crimes but merely provides a means by which a state may obtain the return and punishment of persons charged with or convicted of having committed a crime who fled the jurisdiction of the state whose law has been violated. It is therefore immaterial whether at the time of the commission of the crime for which extradition is sought, no treaty was in existence. If at the time extradition is requested here, there is in force between the requesting and the requested state a treaty covering the offense on which the request is based. The treaty is applicable. Letter B. No. A cannot contest his extradition on the ground that it violates the ex post facto provision of the Constitution, as held in Wright v. Court of Appeals. The prohibition against ex post facto laws in Section 22, Article 3 of the Constitution applies to penal laws only and does not apply to extradition treaties. Q. John is a former president of the Republic X, bent on regaining power, which he lost to President Harry. In an election, fully convinced that he was cheated, he set out to destabilize the government of President Harry by means of a series of protest actions. His plan was to weaken the government and when the situation became ripe for a takeover, to assassinate President Harry. 
William, on the other hand, is a believer of human rights and a former follower of President Harry, noting the systematic acts of harassment committed by the government agents against farmer, farmers protesting the seizure of their lands, laborers complaining of low wages, and students seeking free tuition. William organized groups which held peaceful rallies in front of the presidential palace to express their grievances. On the eve of the assassination attempt, John's men were caught by members of the presidential security group. President Harry went on air threatening to prosecute plotters and dissidents of his administration. The next day, the government charged John with assassination attempt and William with inciting to sedition. John fled to, Rep to Republic A. William, who was in Republic B, attending a lecture on democracy, was advised by his friends to stay in Republic B. Both Republic A and Republic B have conventional extradition treaties with Republic X. If Republic X requested the extradition of John and William, can Republic A deny the request? Why state your reasons fully? Answer, Republic A can refuse to extradite John because his offense is a political offense. John was plotting to take over the government and the plan of John to assassinate President Harry was part of such plan. However, if the extradition treaty contains an attendant a tenant clause, Republic A can extradite John because under the attendant clause, the taking of the life or attempt against the life of a head of state or that of the members of a family does not constitute a political offense and therefore extraditable. Alternative answer. Republic A may or can refuse the request of extradition of William because he is not in its territory and thus it is not in the position to deliver him to Republic X. Even if William were in the territorial jurisdiction of Republic A, he may not be extradited because inciting to sedition of which he is charged constitute a political offense. It is the standard provision of extradition treaties such as the one between Republic A and Republic X that political offenses are non-extraditable. Alternative answer, Republic B can deny the request of Republic X to extradite William because his offense was not a political offense. On the basis of the predominance or proportionality test, his acts were not directly connected to any purely political offense. Q. The Philippines and Australia entered into a treaty of extradition concurred in by the Senate of the Philippines on September 10, 1990. Both governments have notified each other that the requirements for the entry into force of the treaty have been complied with. It took effect in 1990. The Australian government is requesting the Philippine government to extradite its citizen Gibson, who has committed in his country the indictable offense of obtaining property by deception in 1985. The said offense is among those enumerated as extraditable in the treaty. For his defense, Gibson asserts that the retroactive application of the extradition treaty amounts to an ex post facto law rule on Gibson's contention. A. Gibson is incorrect. In Wright v. Court of Appeals, it was held that the retroactive application of the treaty of extradition does not violate the prohibition against ex post facto laws because the treaty is neither a piece of criminal legislation nor a criminal procedural statute. It merely provided for the extradition of persons wanted for offenses already committed at the time the treaty was ratified. Q. Lawrence is a Filipino computer expert based in Manila who in invented a virus that destroyed all the files stored in a computer. Assume that in May 2005, this virus spread all over the world and cost $50 million in damage to property dollars, that's $50 million in damage to property in the United States, and that in June 2005, he was criminally charged before the United States courts under their anti-hacker law. Assume that in July 2005, the Philippines adopted its own anti-hacker law to, strengthen, to strengthen existing sanctions already provided against damage to property. The United States has requested the Philippines to extradite him to U.S. courts under the RPUS extradition treaty. Is the Philippines under an obligation to extradite Lawrence? State the applicable rule and its rationale. Answer. If there was no anti-hacker law in the Philippines, when the United States requested the extradition of Lawrence, the Philippines is under no obligation to extradite him. Under the principle of double criminality, extradition is available only when the act is an offense in both countries. Cruz, International Law. Double criminality is intended to ensure each, sta each state that it can re rely on reciprocal 
treatment and that no state will use its processes to surrender a person for conduct which is which it does not characterize as criminal alternative answer even if there was no anti-hacker law in the Philippines when the United States requested the extradition of Lawrence. If the act penalized under the anti-hacker law of the United States is similar to malicious mischief under Article 327 of the Revised Penal Code, the Philippines will be under obligation to extradite Lawrence. Q. Assume that the extradition request was made after the Philippines adopted its anti-hacker legislation. Will that change your answer? Answer, the Philippines will be under obligation to extradite Lawrence. Both the Philippines and the United States have an anti-hacker law. The requirement of double criminality is satisfied even if the act was not criminal in the requested state at the time of its occurrence, if it was criminal at the time that the request was made. Alternative answer, the Philippines is under no obligation to extradite Lawrence. There was no anti-hacker law in the Philippines when Lawrence was charged in the United States. Hence, an extradition of Lawrence is tantamount ex post facto application of the Philippines anti-hacker law, prohibited by Section 22 on Article 3 of the 1987 Constitution. What is the difference, if any, between extradition and deportation? Answer. The following are the differences between extradition and deportation. Extradition is affected by the benefit of the state to which the person being extradited will be surrendered because he is a fugitive criminal in that state, while deportation is affected for the protection of the state expelling an alien because his presence is not conducive to the public good. Extradition, letter B, is affected on the basis of an extradition treaty or upon the request of another state, while deportation is the unilateral act of the state expelling an alien. In extradition, letter C, the alien will be surrendered to the state asking for his extradition, while in deportation, the undesirable alien may be sent to any state willing to accept him. International Human Rights Q. Walang Sugat, a vigilante group composed of private businessmen and civic leaders previously victimized by the Nationalist Patriotic Army NPA rebel group, was implicated in the torture and kidnapping of Dr. Mangele a known NPA sympathizer, under public international law what rules properly apply, what liabilities, if any, arise thereunder if Walang Sugat's involvement is confirmed. Answer. On the assumption that Dr. Mengele is a foreigner, his torture violates the international covenant of civil and political rights to which the Philippines has acceded. Article 7 of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights provides, No one shall be subjected to torture or to cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. In accordance with Article 2 of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, it is the obligation of the Philippines to ensure that Dr. Mengele has an effective remedy, that he shall have his right to such a remedy determined by competent authority, and to ensure the enforcement of such remedy when granted. Alternative answer. On the assumption that Dr. Mangeli is a foreigner, his claim will have to be directed against the members of Walang Sugat on the basis of the Philippine law and be addressed to the jurisdiction of Philippine courts. His claim may be based on the generally accepted principle of international law, which form part of Philippine law under Section 2, Article 2 of the Constitution. His claim may be premised on relevant norms of international law of human rights. Under international law, Dr. Mangele must first exhaust the remedies under Philippine law before his individual claim can be taken up by the state of which he is a national, unless the said state can satisfactorily show it is its own interests that are directly injured. In this condition, if this condition is fulfilled, the said state's claim will be directed against the Philippines as the subject of international law. Thus, it would cease to be an individual claim of Dr. Mangele. Dr. Mangela's case may concern international law norms on state responsibility, but the application of these norms require that the basis of responsibility is the relevant acts that can be attributed to the Philippines as a state. Hence, under the full principle of attribution, it is necessary to show that the acts of the vigilant group Walang Sugat can be legally attributed to the Philippines by the state of which Dr. Mangele is a national. The application of treaty norms of international law and human rights, such as the provision against torture in the international covenants in civil and political rights pertain to states, the acts of private citizens composing Walang Sugat cannot themselves constitute a violation by the Philippines as a state. Q. 
On October 13, 2001, members of Alibaba, a political extremist organization based in and under the protection of Country X and espousing violence worldwide as a means of achieving its objectives, planted high-powered explosives and bombs at the International Trade Tower, ITT, in Dual City, in Country Y, a member of the United Nations. As a result of the bombing and the collapse of the 100-story Twin Towers, about 2,000 people, including women and children, were killed or injured, and billions of dollars in property were lost. Immediately after the incident, Alibaba, speaking to its leader, Bin Derdandat, admitted and owned responsibility for the bombing of ITT, saying that it was done to pressure countrywide to release captured members of the terrorist group. Alibaba threatened to repeat its terrorist attacks against Countrywide if the latter allies failed to accede to Alibaba's demands. In response, Countrywide demanded that Country X surrender and deliver Bin Derdandat to the government authorities of Countrywide for the purpose of trial and in the name of justice, Country X refused to accede to the demand of Countrywide. What action or actions can Country Y legally take against Alibaba and Country X to stop the terrorist activities of Alibaba and dissuade Country X from harboring and giving protection to the terrorist organization? Support your answer. Answer. Country Y may exercise the right of self-defense, as provided under Article 51 of the UN Charter, until the Security Council has taken measures measure necessary to maintain international peace and security. Self-defense enables countrywide to use force against country X as well as against the Alibaba organization. It may bring the matter to the Security Council, which may authorize sanctions against country X, including measure invoking the use of force. Under Article 4 of the UN Charter, country Y may use force against country X as well as against the Alibaba organization by authority of the UN Security Council. Alternative answer. Under the Security Council Resolution Number 1368, Eight, the terrorist attack of Alibaba may be defined as a threat to peace, as it did in defining the September 11, 2001 attacks against the United States. The resolution authorizes military and other actions to respond to terrorist attacks. However, the use of military force must be proportionate and intended for the purpose of detaining the persons allegedly responsible the, for the crimes and to destroy military objectives used by the terrorists. The fundamental principles of international humanitarian law should also be respected. Country Y cannot be granted sweeping discretionary powers that include the power to decide what states are behind the terrorist organization. It is for the Security Council to decide whether force may be used against specific states and under what conditions the force may be used. Q. Not long ago, Allied forces led by, led by American and British armed forces invaded Iraq to liberate the Iraqis and destroy suspected weapons and of mass destruction. The Security Council of the United Nations failed to reach a consensus on whether to support or oppose the war of liberation. Can the action taken by the Allied forces find just justification in international law? Answer. The United States and its Allied forces cannot justify their invasion of Iraq on the basis of self-defense under Article 51 attack by Iraq and there was no necessity for anticipatory self-defense, which may be justified under customary international law. Neither can they justify their invasion on the ground that Article 42 of the Charter of the United Nations permits the use of force against a state if it is sanctioned by the Security Council. Resolution 1441, which gave Iraq a final opportunity to this arm or face serious consequences did not authorize the use of armed forces. Alternative answer, in international law, the action taken by the Allied forces cannot find justification. It is covered by the prohibition against the use of forces, force prescribed by the United Nations Charter and it does not fall under any of the exceptions to that prohibition. The UN Charter in Article 2, number 4, prohibits the use of force in the relations of states by providing that all members of the UN shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in any other manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations. This mandate does not only outlaw war, it encompasses all threats and of and acts of force or violence short of war. 
and thus provided the prohibition is addressed to all UN members. However, it is now recognized as a fundamental principle in customary international law and as such is binding on all members of the international community. The action taken by the Allied forces cannot be justified under any of the three exceptions to the prohibition against the use of force which the UN Charter allows. These are 1. Inherent right of individual or collective self-defense under Article 51. 2. Enforcement measure involving the use of armed forces by the UN Security Council under Article 42. And 3. Enforcement measure by regional arran arrangement under Article 53 as authorized by the UN Security Council. The Allied forces did not launch military operations and did not occupy Iraq in the claim that their action was in response to an armed attack by Iraq, which of which there was none. Moreover, the action of the Allied forces was taken in defiance or disregard of the Security Council Resolution Number 1441, which set up an enhanced inspection regime with the aim of bringing to full and verified completion that is armament process, giving Iraq a final opportunity to comply with its disarmament obligations. This resolution was in the process of implementation, so was Iraq's compliance with such disarmament obligation. Q. A terrorist group called the Emerald Brigade is based in the states of Asialand. The government of Asialand does not support the terrorist group, but being a poor country is powerless to stop it. The Emerald Brigade launched an attack on the Philippines, firing two missiles that killed thousands of Filipinos. It then warned, warned that more attacks were forthcoming. Through diplomatic channels, the Philippines demanded that Asylan stop the Emerald Brigade. Otherwise, it will do whatever is, ne is necessary to defend itself. Receiving reliable intelligence report of another imminent attack by the Emerald Brigade, and it appeared, appearing that ASEAN was incapable of preventing the assault, the Philippines sent a crack commando team to ASEAN. The team stayed only for a few hours in ASEAN, succeeded in killing the leader and most of the members of the Emerald Brigade, then immediately returned to the Philippines. A. Was the Philippine action justified under the international law principle of self-defense? Explain. Answer. The Philippine action cannot be justified as self-defense. Self-defense is an act of state by reason of an armed attack by another state. The acts of terrorism in this case were acts of private group and cannot be attributed to ASEAN, which does not support the Emerald Brigade. Article 51 of the Charter of the United Nations has no applicability because self-defense in Article 51 contemplates a response to a legitimate armed attack by a state against another state. The attack by the Emerald Brigade is an attack by a private group without authority or as an organ of ASEAN. B. As a consequence of the foregoing incident, ASEAN charges the Philippines with violation of Article 2.4 of the United Nation, Nation Charter that prohibits the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity of polit or political independence of any state. The Philippines counters that its commando team neither took any territory nor interfered in the political process of ASEAN, which contention is correct. Answer. The contention of ASEAN is correct. The Philippines violated Article 2, Number 4 of the Charter of United, United Nations which prohibit states from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity of any state. Let us see. Assume that the commando team captured a, mem a member of the Emerald Brigade and brought him back to the Philippines. The Philippine government insisted that a special international tribunal should try the terrorists. On the other hand, the terrorists argued that terrorism is not an international crime and therefore the municipal laws of the Philippines would recognize which recognize access of the accused to constitutional rights should apply, decide with reason. A. The terrorists should be tried in, Philippi in the Philippines. Section 58 of RA 9372, the Human Security Act, provides for its extraterritorial application to individual person who, although outside the territorial limits of the Philippines, commits an act of terrorism directly against Filipino citizens, where their citizenship was a factor in the commission of the crime. Q. In 1993, historians confirmed that during World War II, comfort women were forced into serving the Japanese military. These women were either abducted or lured by false promises of jobs or cook or waitresses and eventually forced 
against their will to have sex with Japanese soldiers on a daily basis during the course of the war, and only suffered from severe beatings and ven venereal disease, says. The Japanese government contends that the comfort stations were run as on-site military brothels or prostitution houses by private operators and not by the Japanese military. There were many Filipino comfort women. Name at least one basic principle of norm of international humanitarian law that was violated by the Japanese military in the treatment of the comfort women. Answer. The treatment of comfort women by the Japanese military violated Article 27 of the Geneva Convention, which provides that women shall be especially protected against any attack on their owner, in particular against rape and forced prostitution or any form of indecent assault. Alternative answer. The treatment of comfort women by the Japanese military violated Article 2 of the Geneva Convention, which prohibits outrageous upon personal, personal dignity, in particular humiliating and degrading treatment. Q. The surviving Filipina comfort women demand that the Japanese government apologize and pay them compensation. However, under the 1951 San Francisco Peace Agreement, the legal instrument that ended the state of war between Japan and the Allied forces, all the injured states, including the Philippines, received war reparations and in return waived all claims against Japan arising from the war. Is that a valid defense? Answer. The defense is not valid. Under the preamble of the San Francisco Treaty, Japan undertook to conform to the protection and observance of human rights. Article 103 of the United Nations Charter provides that the obligations of the member state prevail over any other international agreement. The waiver in Article 14, Letter A of the San Francisco Treaty is qualified by Article 14, Letter B, which stated that Japan had no resources presently sufficient to make complete reparation for all such, such damages and sufferings and meet its other obligations. Thus, the waiver was operative only while Japan had inadequate resources. Q. The, su the surviving Filipina comfort women sued the Japanese government for damages before Philippine courts. Will that case prosper? Answer. The Filipino comfort women cannot sue Japan for damages because a foreign state may not be sued before a Philippine before Philippine courts as a consequence of the principles of independence and equality of states. Republic of Indonesia versus Bonson. Q. Breden, Jolan, and Andy, Filipino tourists, were in Bosnia, Herzegovina, when hostilities erupted between the Serbs and the Muslims. Penniless and caught in the crossfire, Breden, Jolan, and Andy, being retired generals, offered their services to the Muslims for a handsome salary, which offer was accepted. When the Serbian National Guard approached Sarajevo, Sarajevo the Muslim civilian population spontaneously took up arms to resist the invading troops. Not finding time to organize, the Muslims wore armbands to identify themselves, vowing to observe the laws and customs of war. The three Filipinos fought side by side with the Muslims. The Serbs prevailed, resulting in the capture of Redin, Jolan, and Andy, and part of the civilian fighting force. A Redin, Jolan, and Andy considered combatants, thus entitled to re treatment as prisoners of war? Are the captured civilian likewise prisoners of war? Answer. Read to letter A. Redin, Jolan, and Andy are not combat combatants, and are not entitled to treatment as prisoners of war because they are mercenaries. Article 47 of the Protocol 1 to the Geneva Convention of 1949 provides a mercenary shall not have the right to be combatant or a prisoner of war pursuant to Article 47 of the Protocol 1 of the Geneva Conventions of 1949. Breden, Jolan, and Andy are mercenaries because they were recruited to fight in an armed conflict they, in fact, took direct part in the hostilities. They were motivated to take part in the hostilities, essentially, by the desire for private gain and, in fact, was promised a handsome salary by the Muslims. They were neither nationals of a party to the conflict nor residents of territory controlled by a party to the conflict. 
They are not members of the armed forces of a party to the conflict, and they were not sent by a state which is not a party to the conflict on official duty as members of its armed forces. Letter B. The captured civilians are prisoners of war. Under Article 4 of the Geneva Convention rel relative to the treatment of prisoners of war, inhabitants of a non-occupied territory who, on the approach of the enemy, spontaneously take up arms to resist the invading forces without having had time to form themselves into regular armed forces, provided they carry arms openly and respect the laws and customs of war, are considered prisoners of war if they fall into the power of the enemy. Q. Switzerland and Australia are outstanding examples of new neutralized states. A. What are the characteristics of a neutralized state? Is neutrality synonymous with neutralization? If not, distinguish one from the other. Answer to letter A. Whether simp simple or composite, a state is said to be neutralized where, the, where its independence and integrity are guaranteed by an international convention on the condition that such state obligates itself never to take up arms against any other state except for self-defense or enter into such international obligations as would indirectly involve it in war. A state seeks neutralization where it is weak and does not wish to take an active part in international politics. The power that guarantee its neutralization may be motivated either by balance or power considerations or by the desire to make the weak state a buffer between the territories of the great powers. Letter B. Firstly, Neutrality obtains only during war, whereas neutralization is a condition that applies in peace or in war. Secondly, neutralization is a status created by means of treaty, whereas neutrality is a status created under international law by means of a stand on the part of a state not to side with any of the parties at war. Thirdly, neutrality is brought about by a unilateral declaration by, a new, by the neutral state while neutralization cannot be affected by unilateral act but must be recognized by other states. Q. State Epsilon during peacetime has allowed foreign ships innocent passage through Mantranas Strait, a strait within Epsilon's territorial sea which has been used by foreign ships for international navigation. Such passage enabled the said ships to traverse the strait between one part of the high seas to another. On June 7, 1997, a warship of state Beta passed through the above-named strait. Instead of passing through continuously and expeditiously, the ship delayed its passage to render assistance to a ship of, a state, of state Gamma, which was distressed with no one nearby to assist. When confronted by Epsilon about the delay, Beta explained that the delay was due to a force majeure in conformity with the provision of Article 18, Number 2 of the 1982 Convention on the Law of the Sea, UN Clause. Seven months later, Epsilon suspended the right of innocent passage of warship through Mantrana Strait without giving any reason therefore. Subsequently, another warship of Beta passed through the said strait and was fired upon by Epsilon's coastal battery. Beta protested that for said act of Epsilon drawing attention to the existing customer international law that the regime of innocent passage, even of transit passage, is non-suspendable. Epsilon countered that Mantrana Strait is not a necessary route, there being another suitable alternative route, resolved above mentioned controversy. Answer. Assuming that Epsilon and Beta are parties to the UN clause, the controversy may be resolved as follows. Under the UN clause, warships enjoy a right of innocent passage, it appearing that the position of Epsilon's territorial sea in question is a strait used for international navigation, Epsilon has no right under international law to suspend the right of innocent passage. Article 45, number 2 of the UN clause is clear in providing that there shall be no suspension of innocent passage through straits used for international navigation. On the assumption that the strait in question is not used for international navigation, still, the suspension of innocent passage by Epsilon cannot be effective because suspension is required under international law to be duly published before it can take effect. There being no publication prior to the suspension of innocent passage by Beta's warship, Epsilon's act acquired no validity. Moreover, Epsilon's suspension of innocent passage may not be valid for the reason that there is no showing that it is essential for the protection of its security. The actuation of Beta's warship in restoring 
in resorting to delayed passage is for costs recognized by the UN clause as excusable. For the purpose of rendering assistance to persons or ship in distress, as provided in Article 18, Number 2 of the UN clause, hence Beta's warship complied with the international law norms on right of innocent passage. Q. En route to the tuna fishing grounds in the Pacific Ocean, a vessel registered in country TW entered the Balintang, Balintang Channel north of Babuyan Island and with special hooks and nets dragged up red corals found near Batanis. By international convention, certain corals are protected species. Just before the vessels reach the high seas, the coast Guard patrol intercepted the vessel and seized its cargo, including tuna. The master of the vessel and the owner of the cargo tested, claiming the rights of transit passage and innocent passage, and sought recovery of the cargo and the release of the ship. Is the claim meritorious or not? Reason. Answer. The claim of innocent passage is not meritorious. While the vessel has the right of innocent passage, it should not commit a violation of any international convention. The vessel did not merely navigate through the territorial sea. It also dragged red corals in violation of the international convention which protected the red corals. This is prejudicial to the good order of the Philippines. Article 19, Number 2 of the Convention on the Law of the Sea. Q. Distinguish briefly but clearly between the territorial sea and the internal waters of the Philippines. A. Territorial sea is an adjacent belt of sea with a breadth of 12 nautical miles measured from the baselines of a state and over which the state has sovereignty, Articles 2 and 3 of the Convention. 336 on the Law of the Sea. Ship of all states enjoy the right of innocent passage through the territorial sea, Article 14 of the Convention on the Law of the Sea. Under Section 1, Article 1 of the 1987 Constitution, the internal waters of the Philippines consist of the waters around, between, and connecting the islands of the Philippine archipelago. Regardless of their breadth and dimensions, including the waters in bays, rivers, and lakes, no right of instant passage for foreign vessels exit in the case of internal waters. Harris, Case, Materials on International Law, 5th edition. Internal waters are the waters on the landward side of baselines from which the breadth of the territorial sea is calculated. Territorial Sea, Q. Describe the following maritime regimes under UN Clause. A. Territorial Sea. B. Contiguous Zone C. Exclusive Economic Zone D. Continental Shelf A. Under the provision of Unit Clause Number 3 The territorial waters of an archipelagic state shall extend up to 12 nautical miles from its baselines over which the state exercises jurisdictional control. Letter B. Its contiguous zone shall extend up to 24 nautical miles over which the state exercises control, as is necessary to prevent infringement of its customs, fiscal, immig fiscal immigration, or sanitary laws within its territory. C. Its exclusive economic zone shall extend up to 200 nautical miles from its baselines over which the state exercises sovereignty over all the exploration, exploitation, or conservation and managing of the economic natural resources, whether living or non-living. Letter D. Its continental shelf comprises the seabed and subsoil of the submarine areas that extended beyond its territorial sea throughout the natural prolongation of its land territory to the outer edge of the continental margin or to a distance of 200 nautical miles from the baseline from which the breadth of the territorial sea is measured where the outer edge of the continental margin does not extend up to that distance. Q. In the desire to improve the fishing methods of the fishermen, the Bureau of Fisheries, with the approval of the President, entered into a memorandum of agreement to allow Thai fishermen to fish within 200 miles from the Philippine Sea coast to the condition that Filipino fishermen be allowed to use Thai fishing equipment and vessels and to learn modern technology in fishing and canning. Is the agreement valid? Answer, no. The President cannot authorize the Bureau of Fisheries to enter into a memorandum of agreement allowing Thai fishermen to fish within the exclusive economic zone of the Philippines because the Constitution reserves to Filipino citizens the use and enjoyment of the exclusive economic zones of the Philippines. Q. Explain exclusive economic zone. 
The exclusive economic zone under the Convention on the Law of the Sea is an area beyond and adjacent to the territorial sea, which shall not extend beyond 200 nautical miles from the baselines from which the territorial sea is measured. The coastal state has in the exclusive economic zone. A. Sovereign rights for the purpose of exploring and exploiting, conserving, and managing the natural resources, whether living or non-living, if the waters super, super, adjacent, super adjacent to the seabed and of the seabed and subsoil, and with regard to other activities for the economic exploitation and exploration of the zone, such as the production of energy from the water, currents, and winds. B. Jurisdiction as provided in the relevant provisions of the Convention with regard to the establishment and use of artificial islands, installation and structures, marine scientific research, and the protection and preservation of the marine environments, other rights and duties provided for in the Convention. Q. Distinguish briefly but clearly between the contiguous zone and the exclusive economic zone. A. Contiguous zone is a zone contiguous to the territorial sea and extend up to the 12 nautical miles from the territorial sea and over which the coastal state may exercise control necessary to prevent infringement, infringement of its custom, fiscal, immigration or sanitary laws and regulations within its territory or territorial sea. Article 33 of the Convention on the Law of the Sea. The exclusive economic zone is a zone extending up to 200 nautical miles from the baselines of a state over which the coastal state has sovereign rights for the purpose of exploring and exploiting, conser conversing, conserving, and managing the natural resources, whether living or non-living, of the waters superjacent to the seabed and of the seabed and subsoil, and with regard of other activities for the economic exploitation and exploration of the zone. Articles 56 and 57 of the Convention on the Law of the Sea. Q. Enumerate the rights of the coastal state in the exclusive economic zone. A. In the exclusive economic zone, the coastal state has sovereign rights for the purpose of exploring and exploiting, conserving and managing the natural resources, whether living or non-living, of the waters superjacent to the seabed and of the seabed and its subsoil, and with regard to other activities for the economic exploitation and exploration of the zone, such as the production of energy from the water, currents and winds, in an area not extending more than 200 nautical miles beyond the baseline from which the territorial sea is measured. Other rights include the production of energy from the water, currents and winds, the establishment and use of artificial islands, installation and structures, marine scientific research, and the protection and preservation of the marine environment. Article 56, UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Okay, that's the end of it.